talking with the experts. In episode 562, learn how to build and scale B2B sales teams with expert Olaf Leschniak. Get actionable tips for success. It's great that you bring this up because um, I, I just recently was advising one of the uh, one of my clients, and they are oftentimes go to conferences and events for branding purposes, which is great, but they are not leveraging the digital channel within these events. So they go, they you know exchange some business cards, they do a couple of handshakes, they have a few drinks, you know, and you know at post conference events, the usual stuff. But nowadays, if you want to keep the relationship going, you should, you know, add people on socials. You should ask them for their emails to join your broadcast, to join your newsletter, or to, you know, like join your audience, let's say. Right? Talking with the experts. Welcome to Talking with the Experts. This is where we discuss great ideas to take your business to the next level. How do we know these ideas work? Well, it's because we're talking with business owners who are using these ideas. Business owners who have years of experience and expertise. All things business by business owners for business owners. And now, here is your host, Rose Davidson. Hello, welcome to Talking with the Experts. I'm your host, Rose Davidson from talkingwiththeexperts.com. Talking with the Experts is all about business by business owners for business owners. You can find it on all podcasting, streaming platforms and on YouTube. And today, my great pleasure to introduce you to Olaf Leschnack. And he is from Poland and he's going to be discussing with us how to build and scale B2B sales. And some of the things we're going to be discussing is how to build a sales team from scratch, how to optimize sales team performance, and how to set KPIs for sales teams. Now, Olaf is the entrepreneurial spirit personified. He has a rich history in the IT sector. He launched a system integration firm, steering it towards a lucrative acquisition and established a global software development company. His expertise in B2B sales is over a decade strong, marked by the art of clinching multi-million dollar deals with a personal touch. A builder at heart, Olaf has assembled formidable sales teams tailored to B2B success, orchestrated the adoption of CRM systems, and has been the driving force behind crafting and executing sales processes for diversive organisations. His uh, strategic acumen doesn't just in with sales, he's been the mastermind of marketing and sales strategies that have catapulted his ventures past the seven-figure venue mark. And he, all our businesses um, don't just grow, they scale to new peaks of success, mirroring his own entrepreneurial journey. Olaf, welcome to Talking with the Experts. It is such a pleasure to invite you to share your knowledge with us today. Hi Rose, it's it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for a very warm and and you know very you know humbling introduction. <laughs> it's my very great pleasure. I didn't write it. <laughs> um, so tell me a little bit about your journey. Uh, what led you to um, do what you are doing towards B two B sales? Yeah, so actually, you know, when I sold my businesses last year, uh, I figured that I wanted to do something else, something more. So I, I'm an entrepreneurial spirit, as as you said in the introduction. So I just wanted to build another business. And because I have experienced multiple times, uh, you know, requests by my entrepreneurial friends and peers to, you know, give them advice here and there on marketing and sales and how do you do that? How did you do that? And would, would you mind helping me with this or that? And then I figured, okay, so it seems that there is a niche, there is a need on the market for consulting uh, around B2B sales because you can find a lot of agencies, a lot of people that are helping with more of a B2C side of things. But a lot of marketing agencies, they do not have a good understanding of the complexity of B2B. So I figured, okay, I'm going to launch something that will you know, help entrepreneurs of different sizes scale their businesses with digital, digital marketing, digital sales, and, and B2B in general. So 
this is this is how the journey started actually yeah very interesting and but you know a lot of people um they're starting out don't understand those complexities of b2b sales can you explain a little bit about you know how they can and uh overcome those little complexities so that they have uh you know a thriving business it's it's very hard you know to to explain the end-to-end journey because these journeys vary from business to business from industry to industry but uh, i would say that you have to understand as an entrepreneur that with b2b it's pretty similar to b2c when it comes to the building of trust when it comes to the establishing relationship with a brand uh, so with with your business uh, for example but it requires more time it requires more information and it requires more effort so when you are buying shoes for example and you are you know comparing different brands and and different models you are figuring out which running shoes you are going to buy for example and you're just like okay so this insole looks like you know like a comfy one this material seems durable and i'm oftentimes running in rain so yeah that's about it so i have to choose between Nike and you know Nike and Reebok and this is okay. So I'm going to go the first one because it's cheaper. So with the B2B, it's pretty similar, but the amount of variables, the amount of things that people are taking under consideration and you know comparing is just a lot bigger because the stakes are a lot higher. Oftentimes people are choosing services or solutions that will serve them for years to come in their businesses. So they are just being more considerate. Mm, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And I think, you know, um, that no like trust factor, you know, we a lot of us don't like to use that uh, analogy, but it, it really comes down to that they have to know you, they have to like what you are, who you are, what you are, what you're offering them, and they have to build that trust, um, you know, that you are going to deliver what you say you're going to deliver uh, on time and on budget in most cases. So, you know, how can we... Um, use that approach and and build a a sales team from scratch you know with building a sales team i would say uh, it it actually starts a bit earlier i would say it starts with building marketing so i oftentimes see the mistake that a lot of b2b businesses are doing is that they are building a sales team without having uh, the actual leads for the sales team to work on and in some cases this works i mean there are people that are and salespeople for years and they are good hunters as we say so they can you know find deal here and there they can you know look for contacts they can create opportunities but that's i would say more and more rare because there is less and less of people like that on the market that have been experiencing and growing their careers as i was doing a decade ago so i remember these times when you have all yellow pages and you were calling people court calling them and you have to create your opportunity nurture your opportunity and then close your opportunity that's the the one reason and the second reason is that there is such a shift in behavior of b2b consumers of b2b clients nowadays because of the digital that we are all all in, all in, (laughs) I mean, all as humans, and we are, you know, with all of our behaviors, decisions, and things that we are doing, we are being online to to an extent that was, that is unprecedented. Because of that, the more and more things are shifting from the sales processes, marketing processes. This is why, in order to even start, in my opinion, of course, building your team, your sales team, you should start with building your marketing or and, you know, doubling down on your marketing in order for salespeople to actually have things to do. And I, you know, just to, just to end it with a, a bit of an anecdote, I, I oftentimes meet with entrepreneurs and they're like, you know, my sales team is not selling. And I'm like, okay, but do they have the leads to work on? And entrepreneurs, owners often ask me, but what do you mean? Salespeople are supposed to sell, right? So what do you mean? Like they, they should create their own leads. And you know, sometimes uh, sometimes owners are surprised that uh, there is such a need for marketing in B2B nowadays. Because, for example, they have been in business for 20 years and they are not used to, uh, to that fact. It used to be different. Yeah, that, well, you know, um, us being in the digital age, 
um, you know, there isn't a lot of face-to-face -face selling anymore. I mean, unless, you know, um, people see you uh, an advert on the television or hear one on the radio or see something on social media, they're not going to know who you are. Um, it, I think a lot of networking events, um, they're not um, defunct as such, but there, I think there are fewer face-to-face opportunities for people to go and actually sell a service or a product unless you go to an expo or you know um a, a bnx or a or a you know one of these business type um networking events i i'm not sure that without the digital age that people would get to really know you and it's really hard for them to get that that like and trust part digitally um, rather than a face-to-face -face experience it's great that you bring this up because um, I, I just recently was advising one of the uh, one of my clients, and they are oftentimes go to conferences and events for branding purposes, which is great, but they are not leveraging the digital channel within these events. So they go, they you know exchange some business cards, they do a couple of handshakes, they have a few drinks, you know, and you know at post conference events, the usual stuff. But nowadays, if you want to keep the relationship going, you should, you know, add people on socials. You should ask them for their emails to join your broadcast, to join your newsletter, or to, you know, like join your audience. Let's say, right? And and uh, you know, this this client of mine have spent a lot of money in the last two years on conferences. And when we, you know, looked for detailed information in CRM it turned out that they have not closed a single sale from the conference. I mean, they, they do have more contacts in their CRM, but it's it's not, you know, organized within the email marketing schema. There is no middle of the funnel in order to nurture those people, to, to, to show them the new content, to invite them back on their website, that kind of stuff. And therefore, you have a huge budget dedicated for events, but if you're not tracking, then, you know, you're, you're basically throwing money uh, you know, a way for, for an effort that might be cool, but it does not produce real results. Yeah, I agree. I think, um, you know, you know, back 10 years ago when I started this, my business, um, I've, uh, I was just doing admin work. I was selling my, my admin services to, out to the marketplace. Um, and you know, when you wanted, went to a, a networking event, a face-to-face -to -face one, it was easy. You'd give your business card, but you'd give details of yourself. You know, you'd give a, a little bit of a, a, a pitch. Um, and a lot of times that doesn't happen now in a face-to-face -face event. Um, people aren't interested in in hearing what you have to say. They just, you know, if they're not interested in, in your product or service, then they'll just walk away and find the next person to speak to. So it is quite difficult now because people have an attention span of an ant, really, and, um, yeah. you know, if, if you don't get them in the first three seconds, they're, they're just going to walk away and leave you. And now more than ever, because of the short content on socials, because of the TikTok and, and you know, stories or on Instagram and so on, you know, the attention span is even, you know, smaller than it used to be. So therefore, you have to adapt. You cannot just, you know, be angry about the fact that it changed. You have to adapt if you want to, you know, still grow your business. Absolutely. And, you know, you talked about, you know, starting your sales team from scratch and the first thing you should do is, you know, do your marketing first and get your sales team. But how do we optimise our sales team performance once we have that sales team established? Yeah, so um, the, the fact, uh, you know, there, there are multiple angles to it. I mean, like, but the, I think that the first thing that you should do if you want to optimize any performance of, of any you know professionals and team of any size you have to have data and uh, you know we tend to and especially salespeople and I'm talking from my own experience as a salesperson <laughs> uh, we we can uh, you know talk ourselves out of everything I mean we are just the best you know the the, the salespeople you know I will just explain everything and why I haven't closed the deal, why I was not able to close the contract. You know, there is always a reason that, you know, a good salesperson can give to their manager. And this is why it's actually very hard to manage, you know, sales teams. But uh, if you have data and you can compare the data between, you know, different members of the department, then there is already a foundation for uh, optimizing, foundation for 
giving constructive feedback and foundation for creating new processes or tweaking the existing processes. So I would say that the first thing that uh, one should do is to look at your CRM and see what is working and are there any differences between each individuals in the sales team? Because looking at that and seeing that one person is closing on average X and the second person is doing two X within the same time frame is already giving you an indication as to who's performing better. And maybe there is a, a, a thing that this first person is doing, that the second person is doing, that there is a, a, a good practice that you can implement and introduce throughout the whole organization. Or maybe, and this is, of course, not something that I would recommend to do as the first action, but maybe there it, there is a reason to say goodbye to this person that, that is not performing, you know, but... Uh, in order to start optimizing, you have to have data. Absolutely, I think you can't you can't do anything with really without um, data behind you. If you if you don't have the numbers to say, you know that oh, say just take this podcast for instance. I mean, I don't have a lot of uh, subscribers on my YouTube channel, but the fact being that I'm constantly bombarded with um with people asking, can they be on my podcast? So to me, the numbers on my uh, YouTube channel don't mean anything. To me, it's the people asking to come onto my podcast because they know that they're going to get um, get heard on one type of social media channel or some or, or another. So to me, it, that means a lot more to me is the people asking to come on is that rather than the numbers on the YouTube because it it's telling me that um, you know they may not want to subscribe to the channel, but I'm getting watches and people are actually seeing the videos that, that I'm, I'm, I'm putting on there. Yeah. And, and it's, and it's growing, you know, it's, it's like a snowball kind of effect, right? Yeah, I, I agree. I, I mean, I don't think, you know, you I, I, constantly people are asking, can they, can they, um you know, improve my YouTube channel? Can they improve my Spotify? Can they improve my, you know, Apple? And I think why I'm happy with what it is, you know, and, and these people are just looking for money and half the time I don't know the, whether they're scams or they're not. And they're very not very good salespeople because they tell me what's wrong rather than tell, telling me what's right and then going into what's wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I have the same thing because I'm, with my YouTube channel, we are constantly getting like, yeah, you're not getting a lot of views, so maybe you should. I will do your thumbnail, right? And and that's about it, you know. And <laughs> so, so annoying. So that, that, that's right. Yeah, that's annoying. Not, yeah, not very good salespeople. And if if they're working on their own or they're working in a team, especially, they haven't got the right processes in place. That's for sure. And the right manager. Absolutely, absolutely. Now let's touch on KPIs for a minute because we know that KPIs within a business are really, really important. And how can we set those KPIs for within a sales team that so to make them relevant for each team member, not just for one person in, uh, individually? I would say it's it's also a, a bit dependent on the type of business and the type of the process that we have. But I would say that there are a couple of evergreens that you can have, uh, and it doesn't really matter what industry you are in or what kind of uh, what kind of products or services you are selling. And uh, one of these things is the customer lifetime value, and I think this is the, the 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 golden thing that every business should measure, because I am sometimes being approached by entrepreneurs, and you know we talk about campaigns, and I you know present some of the estimations for them and how much this or that campaign can cost you and you know how much you will be paying for ads and people are like oh this seems like a lot of money uh, and i'm like okay maybe but what's your customer lifetime value because you are saying that some of your customers are with you for six five seven years right so so that seems like a lot of time probably they are generating a lot of revenue and they you know start processing thinking about that and like yeah that's that's about a couple of hundreds of thousands of dollars or or even more right and it's like okay so how much would you pay for one more of these customers and then you know their perspective starts to shift so once we know how much our average customer is generating revenue or profit for our business then we can you know look at marketing efforts and sales efforts and scaling our business differently so customer lifetime value is the first thing uh, for sure. I would say that average deal size is a pretty important one. So how much one of the sales opportunities is actually worth. 
And it's good to actually have them divided to different products groups or, or, uh, or service groups. So if I'm selling trainings, if I'm selling implementations of source, if I'm selling licenses, it's good to have separate pipelines within my CRM for that, and then look at the average deal size within these pipelines. Because again, when we compare different size of deals in different pipelines, it may we may find out that, for example, one product that for, for us, it seems like, you know, a golden goose or thing that is generating a lot for our business. It may turn out that it takes uh, a lot of time to close the business, uh, sorry, to close the deal within that pipeline. Or for example, you know, we may find out that there are a lot of new deals within the pipeline, but they are not worth as much. So maybe we can ditch the particular product or service completely, or we can price it differently. You know, we can take again, uh, some actions when it comes to optimizing our uh, our processes. And the last thing I kind of said that in somewhere in between, you know, it was uh, the, the the average closing rate. So how much time does it take for us from getting an opportunity to actually signing a contract? And sometimes, you know, people are also surprised by how long it can take from the first interaction with a customer to actually signing the contract. And knowing that and having the awareness about you know, how much uh, it takes us to actually close the deal uh, can shift the perspective in, in multiple ways. First and foremost, we can act and we can try to trim down the amount of time needed to prepare certain elements or to execute certain stages of the process, like preparing the proposal, like, for example, estimating a project or preparing documents. We can automate things. We can try to think about ways to, to optimize the process again. Or we can, you know, just better forecast what is going to happen within the next months. And we will not be fooling ourselves as, as owners, as, as entrepreneurs that, okay, uh, it seems that we have five new opportunities. So, yeah, probably this worker will be good. But our our average, for example, closing time is six months. So we will not see the revenue this quarter. We will see the revenue next quarter. So these are the, I would say, most uh, relevant uh, APIs that I would measure within the sales team. Yeah, they, they, they're probably right on point too, because there's not much point measuring KPIs that really aren't going to reflect uh, how the business is, is is going at that particular time or, you know, how it could uh, improve itself into the future. Um, so, you know, don't measure anything like social media likes unless you're actually selling something and that that is important to your business um, because, but even a like, a like on a post really doesn't equal a sale. So, you know, why are people so hell bent on, you know, oh, I got, you know, 10, 10 likes on this particular post, but did it get you a sale? Well, is that worth measuring? I don't think so, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, so, uh, so social media presence, social media likes and, and things around marketing, I think they're imp very important to, to measure, but I would say in a more um, helicopter kind of a view. So are we growing within this channel? Are we getting any, uh, any you know, leads from this channel? These are the things that are pretty important. But as you said, I just heard about, just recently heard about an example of a guy that has 2,000 YouTube subscribers and he has four or five million dollars of revenue per year from those 2,000 subscribers because he has a very niche audience and people are buying from him. They are, you know, giving him new projects, getting new business, uh, sorry, generating new business and so on. So you don't have to have hundreds of thousands of, of people following you as long as uh, you are talking to the right people you know, and, and you are you are having audience that is that is trusting you. Absolutely. No, totally 100% agree. I'll have, um, you can be found on LinkedIn. Um, you can be found uh, on your website, theperformance.digital, uh, also on YouTube at uh, performance.digital and on Instagram. Um, where else can people find you? On LinkedIn, for sure. So, sorry, you said LinkedIn, right? You said LinkedIn yes. and you said Instagram. Yeah, sorry. So, so I think that you, you've basically, you know, provided the whole list. I'm also on Facebook, but, you know, uh, a lot of people are, are not using Facebook nowadays or they're, you know, 
so slowly drifting away from that. But once you type Olaf Leshnik in Google, you, I'm reasonably sure that you will be able to find me. Uh, most probably. Olaf, if you were to give some um, little tidbit of wisdom, what might that be? I would say if you are not measuring right now as a business owner, uh, start doing this ASAP. So, uh, you know, look at the data. And you do, if, you, if you don't have the data to look at, uh, think about implementing a CRM system for even your own personal efforts. It can help a lot if someone is a small business owner. Um, but uh, if you have your marketing efforts and you have this feeling that I don't quite know what's going on, you know, I don't know if if actually my articles are generating me the traffic or maybe it's Google ads or maybe it's some other form of advertising. Also, you know, try to think about implementing Google Analytics in a proper way and finding a professional that will, you know, do this on a even a freelance basis and will help you see the picture, the, the, the whole picture, not the blurry picture. So I would say uh, analyze the data. And if you don't have the data, take just a few steps to, to start getting the data in order to uh, just make informed decisions. It helps to sleep better. Yeah, absolutely. Olaf, um, I'm, I'm going to put all of your links in the show notes so people can reach out to you. And please do reach out to Olaf if you want to uh, take advantage of his services because, honestly, they sound absolutely wonderful and his knowledge is uh, is worth bottling, trust me. Olaf, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me and I look forward to discussing this topic with you or a similar topic in the future. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for having me. Have a great uh, rest of your day and uh, you know, have a, rest, have a great rest of your day whenever you are listening to the episode to all of the listeners out there. Thanks, Ella. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. You've been listening to Talking with the Experts, hosted by Rose Davidson. Make sure you have a look at our back catalogue over at talkingwiththeexperts.com. And be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss out on any episode. We look forward to your company next time.